Well, hello, everyone. I'm James Dobson, and you're listening to Family Talk, a listener-supported ministry. In fact, thank you so much for being part of that support for James Dobson Family Institute. Hello, and welcome to this Friday edition of Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk. I'm Roger Marsh, and we have a very special program to share with you today. It was recorded back when Dr. Dobson was still leading Focus on the Family. For this particular interview, he sat down with Ruth Bell Graham, the wife of the late Reverend Billy Graham, to discuss Ruth's most recent book at that time, the book called Prodigals and Those Who Love Them. It was first published in 1991. Ruth Bill Graham was the author of 14 books and the founder of the Ruth and Billy Graham Children's Health Center in Asheville, North Carolina, a ministry that she remained active in until her passing in 2007. Ruth entered heaven knowing that she and Billy raised their five children and many grandchildren to know the Lord. As you may know, the Graham family is very important and cherished both by Dr. and Shirley Dobson and the ministry here at Family Talk. We have had some of Billy and Ruth's children and grandchildren on the program before, and it is our honor to share this relevant and beneficial conversation with you here today. Do you know someone who has a wayward son or daughter? Have you ever had a prodigal child of your own? Well, regardless of your situation, we are confident that today's conversation will offer you hope, encouragement, and practical tools to lead your family well. Here now is Dr. Dobson and his guest, Ruth Bell Graham, on today's special edition of Family Talk. Uh, Ruth, I want to begin by thanking you for this opportunity to chat with you and to express uh, my great appreciation on behalf of all those people out there that are listening to us today and around the world for the life that you all have lived and for the sacrifice that you've made for the gospel and especially for touching so many of us spiritually. Uh, you know, how do we summarize all of those years and all of those miles and all those sacrifices? But I want you to know it's deeply appreciated. Oh, thank you. It hasn't always been easy. Looking back on it, I wouldn't have had it any other way. You have written a book, Prodigals and Those Who Love Them, and we're going to talk about that subject today, uh, on children who, who go wrong, especially uh, within the context of the Christian family at home. You are a private person, and uh, that's kind of a difficult subject for you to address, especially with regard to your own family life, isn't it? Well, yes and no. I couldn't find a single book on this subject, and I know of so many hurting people, uh, especially Christians, who are going through it, and they feel so guilty that they've had a child who's gone away from the Lord. And once you've loved one prodigal, you love all prodigals. And I just wanted some book that would encourage Christian parents uh, who are going through this to know that God had trouble with some of his children, too, mm. and that he's with them. You did not choose to focus this book on your own children no. and your own family. Why not? Because I didn't think it would be fair to them. And besides, it's not just their story, it's everybody's story. Well, I've got a surprise for you, Ruth, <laughs> because we have talked to both Ned and Franklin. Oh. Did, you, <laughs> did you know that? No, that's sneaky. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry to do this to you. Uh, we talked about uh, just this issue. Um, we have a recording, a clip from that program <laughs> that I'd like to share with you now and then get you to react to it. I might tell you Franklin said some absolutely wonderful things about you and his father, and uh, this is one of them. Uh, let me share it with you now. Franklin, your folks uh, handled you very wisely, it looks to me. Uh, in the midst of your rebellion, uh, you said they did not nag you, and they didn't close the door to communication. No, never. Uh, that's one of the things I, I just love about my mom and dad. Uh, they always loved me. I remember my father had a conversation with me. This was in Lausanne, uh, Switzerland. Uh, they had that uh, conference back yes. in 1974. And I was really having a struggle inside, but I pretended uh, that everything was okay. And my father pulled me aside one day and he said, Franklin, uh, your mother and I sense that there's a great struggle inside of uh, your life and you've been riding that fence for a number of years. 
and I feel that you're going to have to make a decision soon. And I want you to know that uh, your mother and I, we're praying for you and we love you. And no matter what you do in life, no matter where you go, no matter what you end up, uh, you're always welcome to come home. And the mm -hmm. door will always be open to you. And we love you. Now, that was especially meaningful to me because you must have been a terrible embarrassment to your dad for a while. Oh, absolutely. I mean, here he was. I'm trying to <laughs> Oh, no. no. <laughs> the, uh, he being in, in the position of being uh, maybe the most prominent uh, minister of the last 25 years, mm -hmm. and uh, people look at a minister's family and say, is it real? And to have a son in rebellion like that uh, must have embarrassed him, and yet he was able to say to you, son, I'm with you. I still love you. Absolutely. Uh, Remember, I never rebelled against what he stood for, yeah. the person of Christ. I never rebelled against that. But I was just wanting to live my life and, and to enjoy life. And my father realized that there was a great spiritual need in my life, and I needed to come to the Savior. And he realized that my drinking, that my smoking, or drugs, or the girls, or whatever, that when I came to Christ, that these things Christ would mm -hmm. deal with. So he never made them issues. But when I got to 16, he realized that I was at that age where... There wasn't much more he could do except just keep mm. those channels open and love us. Uh, he would let us know when we were wrong. He would let us know if there was something that he didn't like. He wasn't a pansy. Uh, you know, he wasn't afraid uh, to confront us. He would let us know his views, but then he wouldn't push it. He would drop it. That was recorded uh, a couple of years ago, as I recall, uh, Ruth. Uh, those were very warm and loving comments that came from Franklin. Uh, I have a letter here from Ned. Let me read it to you. He said, Dear Mother, I don't know why he sent it to me, but uh, <laughs> Dear Mother, the embodiment of a patient prayer. He's referring to you. This is your number two prodigal, expressing my deep thanks and gratitude for the unconditional love that both you and Dad have demonstrated over the years, even during my time of rebellion against God's call to the ministry. I never once doubted your unconditional love and acceptance of me. Because of your love, your patience, and your example, I have learned what it means to walk in faith and, above all, what it means to be obedient, and there I have found true satisfaction. It's my prayer that your and dad's example and my example, you've always said that no one is totally worthless, they can always serve as a horrible example, <laughs> can be used to encourage both the prodigals and those who love them, your loving and thankful son. That's sweet. There is encouragement in this for those who are going through this tough time now. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's the reason that I've focused on both these boys, because they've both not only come back to the Lord, but they're being used by the Lord. And I think there's some parents of adolescents today that need to hear that, don't you? Well, I suppose. I mean, I, I do think we mustn't sacrifice our children on the altar of ministry. Uh, we love them for themselves as individuals. And whether they ever come back to the Lord or not, we go right on loving them to the end. What uh, is the central theme or the primary message that you wanted to convey to the parents of prodigals in writing this book? Hope. The fact that God is faithful. And I was talking to someone last night whose son was gone 26 years and came back. And there's some, like John Newton's mother, who never lived to see her son come back. I think maybe God in his mercy took her when her son was about six years old. I'm not sure as frail as she was, she could have lived through all that he became and, and had the depths to which he sank. But, but it's the faithfulness of God, that there are no hopeless situations with God. He's not finished with us yet. In fact, uh, in your book, you focus on uh, Newton. Any other details in his, his personal life? When we think of John Newton, I think most of us think of amazing grace. That's very apropos because we don't realize how low he sank, how far he went. His mother had trained him in scripture verses and Bible teaching when he was a little boy. He was reading Latin when he was, by the time he was six. Um, not only did, did he work on slave ships, but he became an atheist and used to invent blasphemies that shocked other sailors. I mean, there are no depths to which he could go that he didn't sink. And interestingly enough, he worked on slave ships but he did have not himself become a slave trader till after his conversion, which occurred uh, after a storm at sea when he, everyone thought the boat was 
was uh, going down. And verses his mother taught him as a boy came back to his mind, and he called for, for mercy, and God granted him. And he was a changed man. But the thing was, after he became a Christian, he was kind to his slaves. He treated them totally differently. Then he got out of the business altogether and eventually wound up an Anglican clergyman. And one of his friends was uh, Wilberforce. And they, they became very close. And Wilberforce said that he'd never spent as long as 20 minutes in Newton's presence, but what Newton uh, expressed his deep regret and deep remorse over his slave trading days. And then um, Wilberforce was a close friend of the prime minister. And together, they led the fight against the slave trade, which ended the slave trade in Great Britain. And you can see how God used the experience of his child to help bring to pass the ending of that, that horrible industry. When we hear amazing grace, that's exactly what it was. It was something special. He was really a godly man. So the, uh, the period of rebellion of the early years gave rise to something very different when he became mature. God used it. God used it. And someone said God never wastes the experience of his children. I think it would not have been possible for him to feel the depth of loathing for slavery if he hadn't experienced himself personally. Can you give us, Ruth, a, a window into uh, that period of your family life when your two boys were going through such rebellion without being too personal or, or putting you under, under a microscope. I think people would identify with your feelings and your concern during that time as a mother. What was that like? I tell you, it drives you to your knees. It drives you to the scriptures for the promises. You pray continually and you know that God is faithful and you just don't know how, you don't know when, you don't know how long, and you don't know what's going to happen in the meantime. And it's instinctive, I think, to worry. When a son or a daughter is on drugs or is drinking, you don't know what they will do to other people as well as to themselves while they're under the influence. So my concern was not just for them, but for what might happen through them. I remember when Franklin was going to uh, drive a Land Rover to uh, Amman, Jordan, picked it up in London, and uh, he, he had been at a near Amman to a place called Mofrock, and he said, Mom, they sure do need a Land Rover fully equipped for the desert. But then we didn't feel like he should go by himself. He was, you know, this goof off. <laughs> and so we asked his college roommate, who was a solid Christian, who had been in Vietnam for three tours of duty as a helicopter pilot, and uh, wonderful. He explode with laughter when he, you know, just great, great guy. And Bill Crisobel said, yes, he would take a semester off from college and go with Franklin. And I remember Bill Cristobal laughing later on, telling me how hairy it was driving through Turkey because Franklin would drive with one hand on the steering wheel and the other hand had a flask of whiskey because he said he could drive better if he was relaxed. <laughs> they, they, I, I can't mean, imagine. <laughs> I tell you, before they started <clears throat> off, I was... I was praying John 17. I took that as my prayer for uh, Bill and Franklin. And I came to this verse, and this was our Lord's prayer before he went to the cross. And he said, for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified through the truth. Later on, I heard what a wild trip it was, but they got it to the hospital where it was supposed to go. And the interesting thing is today, uh, Franklin is chairman of the board of that hospital. <laughs> Isn't that exciting? Uh, one of the uh, poems in this book, and you have a number of your poems in this book, is called Sunk in This Gray Depression. Let me read it. You said, Sunk in this gray depression, I cannot pray. How can I give expression when there are no words to say? This mass of vague foreboding, of aching care, Love with its overloading, short circuits prayer. Then through this fog of tiredness, this nothingness, I find only a quiet knowing that he is kind. That was written in September 1980. Is that autobiographical? Yes. Um, most of those poems about the prodigals were definitely autobiographical because that's the way I worked through some of the, the worries. It was just um, therapy for me. So depression... Uh, goes along with being the mother of a prodigal. It is. It, well, maybe, maybe a woman of great faith 
you know, could ride the waves better than I did. But, and I knew that God was faithful, but I didn't have much faith in myself and uh, was so afraid that I'd made irreparable mistakes. At times you feel so guilty. You feel it's your fault that they've done this. I mean, you're, there's this deep concern, and you, you wrestle with God in prayer, pleading for him. But then you have to run home, and you have to entertain guests, and you have to do other things. So at times you just have to say, Lord, you take care of him while I go on about the work. Mm. I mean, God was God, and there was work to do. Ruth, encourage the mother, we'll say, who's listening to us today, who's just about despaired. Uh, her son or her daughter is 18 years of age, is doing things with uh, his or her body that she never in her wildest imagination would have expected, uh, taking drugs uh, into sex, all kinds of, of terrible things. That's happening all across the world, around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you say to the mother who, who is so depressed today that she can hardly function because of that? I would say try to treat your child as God treats you. Compared to God's holiness, what a mess we get ourselves into. I mean, we may not be on drugs and, and what they did, but I mean, compared to God's holiness, we're a mess. But he's not through with us yet. And I would say, above everything, keep your eyes on the Lord and love them. I don't care what they do. Love them and let them know you love them. They desperately need your love. And sometimes uh, they express it in such strange ways in hostility and rebellion and sometimes rudeness. They're crying out for help, but it doesn't sound uh, like it. How in the world can you love them when they're so unlovable? Uh, that's the, uh, the salient feature of, uh, of the quote from my interview with Franklin is that he said there was unconditional love there even when he was, was uh, rebelling and going into such uh, terrible uh, conflict. Uh, how did you accomplish that? Uh, how can you love someone who's doing everything they can to tear you up emotionally and tear up the family? How did God love us? I mean, I've often wondered how on earth God loved us so much that he sent his son to die for us. What did he see in us that was lovable? Some of the most inspiring saints were the most revolting sinners, and yet God loved us. And I think this, it's instinctive to love your own child. I mean, you can't help but love them. You don't love what they're doing. It's like when they were little. I mean, Franklin or Ned would come in grimy, smelly, like all little boys, and Sometimes I make them leave the clothes in the boiler room or the washroom and shower off before they come in the house. <laughs> so you love them and you welcome them home, but not the dirt, not the, you know, what comes with them. Uh, it's, it's the love that makes it so frustrating when they won't do right, no, isn't it? Absolutely, and, and love hurts. It, it hurts to love. It'd be, be so much easier if you could harden your heart and just close the door and forget. But you can't. You go on loving them. We've talked uh, a little bit about Franklin's rebellion. I think we need to give equal time to Ned. Uh, he also went through a tough time and got on drugs too, didn't he? Yes, uh, longer perhaps than Franklin. I remember how I prayed for him that the Lord would keep him and what have you. And he told me a few years ago that he used to go to town and get drugs and sell them to the kids at school. So obviously God didn't see fit to answer the prayer <laughs> I prayed. But he said, Mom, don't worry about it. I said, God's using all these things in, in my ministry as I counsel other people. And he came home and, and was going to college, and I went out, had written out some Bible verses, and I was hiding in different places, his truck, you know, above the uh, sun visor and different parts. And in the pocket of the truck, I found marijuana. So I went and faced him with it, and it's his dad and I talked to him. And He'd lie up one side and down the other, but we'd caught him with the evidence. Now, he claims that I threw it in the fireplace and the chimney smoked and the whole house was filled with it. I'd forgotten that part. <laughs> <laughs> so everybody was just a little happy for a day or two. <laughs> That's according to, yeah, it could have been. It could have been. Isn't it interesting now that both those boys who went through that kind of rebellion and actually were, were using illegal substances are in the ministry today? There is hope in that story. Absolutely. God is faithful. And Ned was very honest. He, he's the kind of saying, you clamp on your bed at about 11 o'clock at night, just let everything all hang out, just mm -hmm. talk everything out. Your eyes would be about half closed about 3 o'clock in the morning, and Ned's still going strong. But it, it helped. <laughs> uh, it helped to listen and to know what was going on inside of him. But this drug business kept up after he was married. He married a, 
a wonderful girl, a nurse from the Mayo Clinic, and I credit her with a great deal of patience with him. He, he, he wouldn't even go to church with her at first. I don't know how the Lord got through to him, but he did. Mm -hmm. And today he is the uh, one of the associate ministers at the church in California and has a tremendous interest in China. Started, they've started an organization of which he's the head that hopes to serve the Lord in China. And all I can say, it's a faithfulness of God and the grace of God. Uh, in the uh, interview that I did with Franklin, he made it very clear that his rebellion was not against right. his parents. That, that'll be hard for people to understand, but I believe him, that the rebellion was not against his parents. It was a desire to taste life. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, we have one more recorded clip uh, from that interview. I, I want you to hear it at this moment. You know, I'm here today because of prayer. And my parents prayed me through uh, that turbulent period in my life. And maybe that is simplistic prayer, but my parents love me enough to pray for me. Boy, I believe and in my that. grandfather I and my grandmother. In that. So I'm here today because of prayer and the grace of God. You knew they were praying for you too, didn't you? Absolutely. Right. And yeah. as a parent now with four children of my own and three sons, I realize how important prayer is. Because now I lay in bed at night, uh, you know, thinking my children are coming to their teenage years. I knew what I did, and I know my parents only know half of it. Hmm. Uh, they don't know all the other things that I did, and I'm never going to tell them. <laughs> <laughs> you are <laughs> telling them right now. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm ashamed. But yet, um, I just pray that God uh, will protect my children. Ruth speaks specifically to what the Bible has to say about intercessory prayer, of one person being able to pray for another one, even if that person is not praying for themselves and doesn't uh, maybe have the faith to do so, you can still go to the Lord on their behalf. I was enormously encouraged when I was reading through the Gospels, and it dawned on me how many times God answered prayer in behalf of someone, not, not the victim themselves, but someone who loved that victim or who was a friend of the victim, like that man born of four, let down through the roof. When Jesus saw their faith, mm -hmm. he said unto him, and then um, Jairus' daughter, she was apparently dead, but the father sent for Jesus over and over again. The man who had a son who had a, a demon, and sometimes he threw himself into the fire and sometimes into the water. And he asked the Lord for help. In fact, the majority of cases, the person didn't ask help for themselves. It's someone who loved them, asked for them, and Jesus never turned them down, which encourages me as a mother. Uh, we can pray not only for our own children, but other prodigals and other parents, and know that no matter how rebellious they are, God's going to hear our prayer. What a wonderful gift that is uh, to us from the Lord, that he allows us to not only pray about our own concerns, but to bring uh, the concerns of others. Uh, that's a tremendous benefit in the Christian way of life. Another thing that the Lord taught me, and this lifted an awful load off my shoulders, and that was when he told me, hey, you take care of the possible and trust me for the impossible. For years, I've been trying to convict of sin, create a hunger and thirst after righteousness, convert. And God said to me, that's not your business. Those are miracles and miracles in my department. You'd love them, uh, encourage them, take care of their needs. Be a mother. You take care of the possible and trust me for the impossible. Boy, what a load lifted. Mm. You know, one of the prayers that Shirley and I have prayed for our kids through the years is that in those moments when our children would stand at a crossroads with two separate directions, one leading toward what's right and one leading toward what's wrong, that the Lord would put an influential person mm. at that crossroads. When they were beyond our reach, when they were beyond our influence, that the Lord would, would strategically place a person at that spot. I began praying that when my daughter was two and our, our son was not even born yet. Ruth, our time is gone. I want to thank you again uh, for granting this interview, uh, for writing this book, and for your great heart for uh, other mothers and fathers out there who are now where you were. Uh, any last thing you want to say to them? Just remember the faithfulness of God. That's a pretty good bottom line for the entire book, isn't it? <laughs> right, that's, that's what it is. Romans chapter 5, verse 8 reads, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this, while we were still sinners, 
Christ died for us. That passage points out that God loved us even when we were unlovable. And like Ruth Bell Graham described today here on Family Talk, parents and family members of prodigals are called to love the unlovable as well and never lose hope that change is possible. Now, if you missed any part of today's program, just visit drjamesdobson.org forward slash broadcast. You can listen to today's interview in its entirety when you're there and also learn more about the legacy of Ruth Bell Graham. That's drjamesdobson.org forward slash broadcast, or give us a call at 877-732-6825. Thanks so much for listening to Family Talk today. God's richest blessings to you and your family. And be sure to join us again next time for another edition of Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk. This has been a presentation of the Dr. James Dobson Family Institute.